Welcome to Powerhouse. Welcome to What It Takes. I'm Emily Kirsch, founder and CEO of Powerhouse and founder and managing partner of Powerhouse Ventures. For those of you who are new to Powerhouse, we are an innovation firm that helps corporations and investors find and engage with the most cutting edge clean energy and mobility startups in the country. We help them tap into market trends and lead the next century of clean technology innovation. It is such an honor to have on What It Takes Today, New York Times bestselling author, nationally recognized change maker, um, and uh, most notably CNN host Van Jones with us. This conversation is especially important to me and meaningful to me because Powerhouse wouldn't exist and I would not be having this <laughs> recording with you today um, if, if it wasn't for you. You uh -huh. founded the Ella Baker Center for Human Rights in 1996, which I was honored to join right out of undergrad. Um, and so I just wanna start by saying thank you for everything that you've done for me and for my career and to help enable what Powerhouse has become. And I wanna welcome you to the show. Oh, well, um, it's, it's an honor, you know, uh, when you, you start a community-based organization in a place like Oakland. Um, you know, you get a chance to meet all kinds of people, young, old, all colors, all men. You know, Oakland's one of the most diverse cities in the world. Um, and, uh, you know, people, you know, they come into the organization, they've got great ideas. Most of those ideas never make it past the whiteboard, past the busher paper, just because that's just the, the, the nature of ideas. But uh, somehow you've taken those ideas you had as a very young person and turned them into you know, one of the most consequential organizations for, for clean energy innovation in the world. And uh, I get to brag on you a bunch. I had very little to do with it. I just said, hello, you're welcome to be here. <laughs> But now I get to I get the bragging right, so I like that. <laughs> so. Well, I, I, thank you. It means it means so much. It means so much, and and it and it's it's uh, yeah, it's just an honor to have you. So thank you. Um, Van, you were born in 1968 in Jackson, Tennessee, with your twin sister Angela. Your parents were both in education. Your mom, a high school teacher. Your dad, a middle school principal. You were raised in the Christian Methodist Episcopal Church, where your grandfather yes. was a church leader. Yeah. What was your childhood like, and what were you like as a kid? I was a nerd. <laughs> <laughs> like everyone who's ever been on this show. <laughs> exactly. No, I, I made Urkel look cool. Uh, I was a... I you was were a, Urkel. You were Stefan Urkel. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. I, I um, uh, you know, this nerdy little guy, super skinny, glasses, um, picked on all the time, called professor and, you know, all that kind of stuff. You know, uh, you do that um, and you do your best. Um, uh, and you and you and you learn and you grow and I, I think for me what was so important about uh, growing up that way is I got a great deal of empathy for outsiders mm. and empathy mm. for people who have been left out. Mm. Yeah. Well said. I know you had an early fascination with political figures and you even matched political figures with your Star Wars action figures so you would match uh, your action figures to JFK or MLK so first who was who as far as the characters and the leaders and then how did this early fascination with with politics come about You know I I don't have an origin story for that you know a lot of people are like oh you know this happened and I got interested in political stuff for whatever reason, just like, you know, some kids who uh, just take to certain things, you know, they take to basketball, they take to the flute, they take to piano. I just took to political stuff. I don't know why. I remember being in kindergarten and Miss Pat, uh, Miss Brown was my kindergarten teacher. There was a student named uh, Patrick Carmody who asked who is Bobby Kennedy or who was Bobby Kennedy? And, um, you know, he had, you know, he died the year I was born. So you're talking about a situation where the, the, the kindergarten teacher is just kind of caught off guard by the question. Mm -hmm. I guess you can imagine if like a Barack Obama had been killed. And then like a few years later, a child's asking, who's Barack Obama? So like, who's Bobby Kennedy? And she started crying. Mm -hmm. And I had never seen an adult cry. Mm -hmm. uh, in fact, you know, they always tell us to stop crying. So I kind of thought that adults couldn't mm -hmm. cry and that only kids could cry. And so seeing an adult cry, I mean, that left a big impact on me. Um, but I just was always interested. Like we had the little weekly readers, uh, the little kind of crappy, like nasty newsprint, you know, the little ink would come off in your hands. And whenever there was anything about, you know, the Kennedys or Dr. King, I would just get my little round scissors and cut the article out and take it home. And, you know, I don't know. So I was, I, there's no origin story. I've always been interested in, in, in politics and God. Just mm, from, mm. From, I was a very prayerful little kid. A uh, very bookish little kid, and for whatever reason, cared a lot about about politics. Hmm. Uh, we're only a few minutes into this, and I've already gotten chills twice. So, 
<laughs> it, was, it was good. Yeah, okay. um, you went to the University of Tennessee at Martin and earned a bachelor's degree in communications and political science. You later attended Yale Law School, where you interned at the Lawyers Committee for Human Rights in San Francisco, through which you served as a legal observer in the Rodney King trial and demonstrations. You protested against the verdict that acquitted the officers of beating Rodney King, and you were arrested for protesting. After those charges were dropped, you and a, a group of other protesters won a small legal settlement. And so I'm curious, mm -hmm. how did your time at Yale Law School and how did this experience uh, serving as an observer and getting arrested shape your career? Well, you know, Wikipedia gets some things right and some things wrong. So <laughs> what would it get wrong? <laughs> yeah, so, so I, I was a legal observer, not of the trial itself but of the mm. demonstrations afterwards gotcha. in the Bay Area. So I got to get somebody who's got privileges to go <laughs> and fix that little thing. Because it's, it's, I, I was never in LA during the, during the uprising, mm -hmm. but I was, mm -hmm. in, um, uh, um, I was in the Bay Area. Mm -hmm. so, and it was, a, it was a lawyer's committee for civil rights. I was working for Eva Patterson, who at the time was a legend. And she still is a, is a, is a legend locally. But at the time, she was a kind of a national civil rights legend. I was working for her. She asked me to go and monitor the demonstrations that were happening after the verdict, because there were protests all around the world, um, and certainly in the Bay Area. Um, and I, I wound up in jail, uh, because the police just swept everybody and put, it, put us all in jail. And I met a bunch of you know, young radicals who you know, were really against uh, you know, the system in a much bigger way than I have been. And um, uh, I, uh, you know, Yale for me, a lot of people that go to law school, they become much more conservative. Uh, they they kind of realize that you know, the system's much more complicated. They see a place for themselves in the system if they get a, a clerkship or they work for a corporate firm and they kind of tone down their views a little bit. Mm -hmm. Even if they went there for public interest, as many students do, they leave committed to the corporate track. Um, I went there committed to public interest and I left committed to like revolutionary change on the biggest scale possible mm. <laughs> because of the, the time when I was in law school, what was going on? I, I got to law school in 1990, I, was, I left in 93. Um, while I was there, um, you saw uh, the Rodney King uprising and for people, who are of the younger generation, they cannot understand what it felt like when the very first time you had a videotape of police beating somebody within an inch of their life, video cameras were not common. They weren't, like, yeah, you got them on your phone, everything's videotaped. That, it was very rare that you had a videotape of anything except maybe like your, your high school graduation or something. It was very, very rare. So to have a videotape beating like that, People thought, finally, what we've been talking about, complaining about for years, you know, you had Public Enemy and, and NWA have been talking about, you know, F the police, like trying to get people to take us seriously. And now we had the proof. And we thought as young people that we were, now they're gonna have to change everything. And the, the jury came back and said, we don't care, beat the crap out of, you know, an armed black motorist. And that was a huge shock. And that's why you had protests around the world. That's why LA burned half to the ground. And here I am, a law student at the number one law school in the world, Yale Law School. And I'm thinking to myself, you know, where is the liberty and justice for all in this? Plus, I had grown up in the rural South. And uh, so when I got to Yale, the whole thing, the class and race dynamics were very, very different. Even the black students were kind of ashamed of me because here I am, this like kid from a, a rural state school. Who the heck is this kid? And then, um, and then I saw drug use uh, on the campus. Now, I was, you know, I'd never seen drug use before because I grew up on the edge of a small town in rural West Tennessee. So when I get to, uh, to Connecticut, I'm seeing drug use on the campus and drug use in the community. And I'm seeing kids the same age, 18, 19, 20, doing drugs at Yale and at worst going to rehab. And then I'm seeing other kids uh, uh, doing drugs in the community and they're going to prison same drugs mm. within eyesight of each other. Mm. Uh, and so I, man, I went to the left side of Pluto. Uh, <laughs> I mean, I was, <laughs> I was as left as you could possibly get. If there was any way for me to be further left, um, I, I didn't figure out what it was, because I would have been. And mm -hmm. I spent, as you know, you know, 10, 15 years of my life uh, suing cops, uh, uh, mm. uh, uh, police departments, working to close abusive youth prisons, um, and just doing everything I could to kind of stop what was what turned out to be 
um, you know, the midpoint of a massive rise of, of, of mass incarceration in the United States. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I know that led you in 1995 to start Bay Area Police Watch, the San Francisco Bay Area's only bar certified hotline and loyal lawyer referral service for victims of police abuse and the hotline immediately started getting over a dozen calls a day. And then in 1996, as I mentioned earlier, you co-founded the Ella Baker Center for Human Rights, where I was fortunate to launch my career. And what started as a, a, a local organization focused on criminal justice reform expanded into a national organization focused both on, on social justice, but also environmental justice. And for so much of your career, especially in the last 20 years, you've explicitly linked criminal justice reform and environmental justice. And I'm curious, what led you to focus your activism on these dual issues and how did you see the links between them manifested? Well, you know, it was personal. Uh, you know, I burned out. Um, you know, you go to a lot of funerals working in urban communities. Uh, you know, you see a lot of you see a lot of kids in caskets. Um, and you go to a lot of community meetings that don't work out. You're in a lot of coalitions that break up. Because um, it's hard to win, you know, when you're poor or your, your, your constituency is poor. You're going up against a downtown machine. You're going up against developers, police officers, unions. And it's just you and your friends. And whoever you can convince to go to the next rally, the next, you know, city council meeting it's hard and I just burned out. Um, and so I started myself trying to get, trying to heal, uh, you know, got therapy, uh, started going to uh, Buddhist uh, retreat centers, uh, especially in Marin County, you know, which is very close to Oakland, but could be three worlds away. Um, and I, um, and I started meeting people who were not a part of the urban struggle, who were not a part of the fight against, you know, the cops and, and, the, and the prison state and that kind of thing, um, but who were uh, ecologically engaged. And they were, you know, white and rich, but they cared a lot and they were, you know, doing solar companies and they were doing green conferences and stuff. And so I started getting invited to that stuff and I started seeing this whole other world, but it was a much whiter world, a much more affluent world. Um, and I started, so now I'm going back and forth from Oakland to Marin County, mm. you know, and, and I'm starting to heal and revive and I'm learning all this stuff and I'm getting more spiritual and I'm, and I'm seeing this, this great green future uh, with all this new technology and all this stuff. And then I'm going back to Oakland where you got cancer clusters, uh, an asthma epidemic because of the port you know, kids going to school, 20, 25%, 50%, sometimes with asthma inhalers in their pockets, mm. um, setting off the metal detectors, not with guns, but with asthma inhalers. And I said, you know, we need green jobs, not jails in Oakland. And those four syllables, green jobs, not jail, economic justice, criminal justice, and environmental justice in four syllables, it just... Mm. It was just like, it was like a bomb in my, in my brain. It just went off. I said, I said, we got to take the people who most need work and connect it to the work that most needs to get done. You know, cause I'm looking at all of these, you know, we're passing these solar bonds and solar this and solar that. And then the consumers are ordering this stuff, but it's not, the solar panels aren't going up for two weeks, three weeks, two months, four months. And I'm like, well, why not? Well, you know, we, we don't have enough workers. So I said, you know, solar panels don't put themselves up, guys. You, you know, it, it takes real people to do that work. And so why not take the people who most need that work, you know, young folks and struggling folks in places like Oakland, and let them do the work that most needs to be done. Now you're fighting pollution and poverty at the same time. Okay. Now you're saying, yeah, we don't have any throwaway resources, any throwaway species. We don't have any throwaway neighborhoods or children either. It's all precious. It's all sacred. So in my mind, it was just an automatic thing that, and also I felt that the environmental business community, the ecological business community, it wasn't just that Oakland needed those jobs. Those folks who were trying to get 
government on their side for environmental solutions needed what the black community brings in terms of our voting ability, in terms of our political savvy, in terms of our place within the Democratic Party. So there could be a real partnership. It's not charity. But if you leave us out, if you leave black and brown folks out, then we become a part of a, of a, of a, of a backlash alliance between polluters and poor people, because then mm. polluters could come to our community and just say, look, these white folks don't care about you. They just want their own solar panels, their own hybrid cars, they want their own Teslas, and they'll mm. stick you with the bill. As they get off the grid for free, and now they're powering everything for free, you're gonna be stuck with the bill. And, and, and they wanna put you know, green taxes on everything, you're gonna pay those taxes. And that sounds real honest to somebody who hasn't seen anybody from the environmental business community do anything but just be in their own little green bubble making money. And mm -hmm. so I said, politically, you need us. Economically, we need you. That's the basis of a stable partnership. I said, we could have a green growth alliance, green growth alliance, where we're building a better future that includes everybody, but it can't just be rhetoric. You got to cut us in. You got to get, and so we went to the Oakland City Council. We got the uh, Oakland Green Jobs course started. You were a big part of that. Um, and yeah, we never had as many kids as we wanted. We never had as much success as we wanted. But the idea, you could take young people who are standing around on street corners in the community centers and train them to put up solar panels. So now they're, you know, the, they're, they're going from presumed to be the villains and the scary kids to being the heroes of the whole mm. planet. Just that vision got Nancy Pelosi so excited about what we were doing at the Ella Baker Center. She took me to Washington, D.C. I got a chance to testify in front of a bunch of committees. And lo and behold, George W. Bush signs the Green Jobs Act of 2007 to spread what we were doing in Oakland all across the country. But I always tell people, I wasn't sitting around, you know, going to, 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 to I was looking for help for myself. I was looking for hope for myself. I had to raise money for my little not-for-profit, so I was happy to take any meetings with anybody who had any money. Um, some of those people were green business people. Um, but it was healing for me that then, you know, turned into something bigger. Mm -hmm. As far as something bigger goes, uh, in 2005, so two years before the Green Jobs Act was passed, mm -hmm. you started implementing these equitable environmental solutions locally, like the Green Collar Jobs Campaign that you mentioned. Um, and part of your work on clean energy, especially in the Bay Area, involves support from the music icon Prince. You and Prince developed this deep friendship that lasted until his death, and you helped him with his philanthropic efforts. Uh, and while you were in, I think you had already gone to D.C. when you were serving as a special advisor to President Obama for Green Jobs. Uh, but you, you and Prince got to talking, and you formed this collaboration between the Ella Baker Center and Green for All and the Oakland-based company Mosaic to bring more solar to the East Bay. And this ultimately led to me leaving the Ella Baker Center to start Powerhouse, so particularly meaningful to, to me. Um, how did your relationship with Prince form and then what impact did it have on your career? You know, I miss, I miss Prince every day. He was, um, he was the worst best friend ever. <laughs> Why the he, worst? He's terrible because <laughs> Prince was never there when you didn't need him, <laughs> okay? If you didn't need him, forget it, mm. right? I got my first TV show, he never called. Um, the show got canceled, he called, <laughs> okay? So he was never there when you didn't need him, mm. but he was always there when you did need him. So he was the worst best friend ever. <laughs> like, um, but um, no, look, I don't know why he picked me out of the bunch. Um, I, I don't. Um, but he, 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 he picked me out of the puppy pile and, uh, <laughs> and, he, and he believed in me. Um, so I know that all spawned a whole bunch of work that's happened in Oakland since then. Um, I mentioned Green for All, another national organization that you founded around environmental justice work. Um, you mentioned the passing of the Green Jobs Act in 2007. Uh, and then this leads us to 2009 when you were appointed as a special advisor for Green Jobs to President Obama. But just six months later, you resigned um, after just constant, a barrage of criticism from conservative media. Mm -hmm. What was that like for you at the time and what did you learn from it? Oh, it was terrible um, because, again, I was on the left side of Pluto in my 20s into my 30s. Uh, but like I said, you know, I, I burned out. Also, I had uh, uh, the good fortune of um, meeting Jana, 
uh, and we had Cabral, my little my little guy, um, and and that tends to calm you down a little bit. Um, you know, all of a sudden you go from f the system, you know, to fix the system because mm-hmm. now you're raising some little person in, in Oakland. You know, you don't have any any delusions of grandeur somebody's going to come burn the whole thing down you're like hey don't don't burn the school down my kids in there you know let's <laughs> right. make the school work better yeah. uh and so you know because yeah you get into your 30s up into your 40s um sometimes not everybody but sometimes mm-hmm. uh, you start seeing things differently and also i started seeing the power of business for good um that's no longer uh as fashionable as you know people have gotten more and more disillusioned but I, I was like, look, man, I, I spent my whole life at that point with, you know, not for profits and protesting government, trying to get government to do stuff. And, you know, I had friends in the business community who, you know, could move millions of dollars around with just like a, you know, the, the flick of a, of a pen mm-hmm. and, and, and invest in stuff and buy stuff and hire people. And so I had kind of formed in my own mind an alliance uh, with the better parts of the, of the business community. Um, and was trying to make that work. So it made sense when Obama reached out to me or his team reached out to me to have me go to the White House because by that point, you know, I had a best-selling book about the green collar economy. I had a, a you know, the first, uh, you know, I had the, the Green Jobs Act under my belt. Uh, we had some local successes that you were a part of. So it kind of made sense that you've got the most hopeful candidate ever, Obama, in the most hopeful moment ever. And the most hopeful idea in that moment was the idea of green jobs. The idea that you're going to turn a breakdown, you know, in the Bush economy, the Bush collapse, you're going to turn a breakdown into a breakthrough, and that, and that you're going to be able to use that that momentum to to pass, you know, cap and trade, and 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 to just basically repower the country clean. And we had serious plans to put millions of people to work, um, you know, putting up solar panels, retrofitting buildings, manufacturing uh, wind turbines, and I wind up getting put in charge of all of it. I mean, which is nuts in that there was, you know, the way things work at the White House level, there there are interagency processes, they call them, interagency processes, which means you get to to pull the best people out of every agency and department that you need to get something done. The green, so Obama had a $787 billion, at the time that was a lot of money, uh, recovery package, and um, 80 billion of the 787 billion was, was for green and clean solutions. But it wasn't all in one place. Some's at the EPA, some's at the Department of Energy, some's at HUD, some's here, some's there. Well, how are you going to spend $80 billion all willy-nilly through these different departments and agencies? Somebody's got to be responsible for coordinating all $80 billion in every department and agency that it touches. That wound up being about 11 departments and agencies. So I go from being a grassroots you know, activist and leader in Oakland to being in charge of $80 billion and having some, you know, say in what, you know, a number of departments and agencies do. And I'll tell you, being a community organizer helped a ton because mm-hmm. I wasn't, I didn't know all the procedures and protocols and stuff like that that slows things down. I just went directly to people, even though I was, you know, all out of line and you know, all out of protocol and you're not supposed to call that person, you got to call that chief of staff, but I don't care. I'm just calling. I'm trying to make stuff happen. So we're snowballing and we're getting stuff done. We were going to do um, at an initiative called Green Scissors for the Red Tape. And we were going to uh, expedite clean energy deployment, wind energy d- deployment in particular on Native American reservations. Because you got so much wind energy on those reservations and yet they got to go through so much bureaucracy with Bureau of Indian Affairs, Bureau of Land Management. So the Native Americans were being unfairly slowed down as others like really just an inch over the border of that res were throwing up wind farms. So, you know, we were going to fix that. I mean, we, we had uh, plans, we had gre- uh, code green Appalachia, where we were going to take wind turbines that were manufactured in Michigan and put them all on those mountain ranges in Appalachia. So they'd stop blowing up the mountains to drag out the coal and use those mountains to still power the country. I mean, we had great stuff and it freaked the right wing out. And, um, and they said, hold on a second, you got this dude who's some berserkly communist (laughs) activist, black nationalist person that sues cops in the Obama White House (laughs) doing stuff. (laughs) Uh, I was like, you know, I didn't think about it that way. (laughs) (laughs) And it was terrible. I mean, I wouldn't, I wouldn't wish it on anybody. It Mm -hmm. was a terrible experience. Hmm. You know, if you're ever the subject of public controversy, Hmm. 
It's like they tear your face off and they staple some ugly face on your face. And then that's your face. And the difference when, you, when you've never been, you know, infamous um, or, 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 or famous, uh, most of the people who know your name, they've at least met you. And so they have a very complex relationship with you. You know, they've seen you happy, they've seen you sad, they've seen your good points, they've seen your bad points. They may not like you, but they actually know you. Once you're famous or infamous, a lot of people have opinions about you. They don't know you. They know one thing about you. They know that, you know, you said you were a communist, which I was when I was in my 20s. <laughs> um, I'm in my 50s, you know, <laughs> like, but, you know, they know that one thing and then they just beat the crap out of you with it. And, you know, it just got to be too much. I wasn't psychologically or emotionally or spiritually prepared for that level. Mm. It was already freaking me out just to be in the White House. I mean, you know, you have imposter syndrome, like you wouldn't believe, like you're walking around with some of the biggest and best brains. I mean, you're, you know, Barack Obama, I mean, is no joke. Michelle Obama, no joke. Valerie Jarrett, no joke. I mean, these are, you know, David Axelrod. I mean, these people are going to be in history books. And, you know, you're walking around in that building, you know, going to meetings and carrying your clipboard and, you know, trying to do a good job, but you already don't feel like you fit in because you're not from the DC thing. You're not, you know, that's my first government job is in the White House. I mean, I didn't even work in the city council, you know? And so, um, and so then you go already, you're not feeling that secure. Uh, and it's a lot of political games in DC. Now I know how to play them, but I know how to play them then. So people are doing a lot of bullshit and you don't really know what's going on half the time. Luckily, the staff people, you know, the, 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 the secretaries, the security people, the, the cafeteria people, they love me because they saw I was there. I was like a regular dude, you know, wearing like clothes from men's warehouse. You know, I didn't have fancy suits, you know what I mean? And I'm just doing the best I can. And, um, and so they would give me little tidbits of advice and help. But um, man, all of a sudden, boom. A new story about you. Boom. New story about you. Not about the work that you're doing. Mm -hmm. Nobody's saying you're doing anything wrong today, but reinterpreting all this stuff. And you know, you get those Google alerts. I got my Google alerts every night, like nine o'clock at night, after the baby was in bed and stuff like that. And I would go in the restroom and I'd look and it was first it's a couple of bad stories and then a few more. And then like every night it would just be all these right wing groups. And you know. Some of the stuff was true, some of the stuff was false, but all of it was out of context. And, um, and ultimately, then they said I was a 9-11 truther, which even when I was like the mo my most radical, I wasn't a conspiracy theorist. And I just said, I can't, you know, I, I just can't deal with it. And um, so I offered to resign, you know, very nobly, and then they accepted. I was like, oop. <laughs> <laughs> like, mm, wasn't expecting that, but okay, cool. <laughs> uh, but... Um, and, uh, and then, you know, I spent a year, you know, clinically depressed, hmm. you know, I wouldn't, I wouldn't, I wouldn't ask anybody to go through what I went through, um, you know, cause, cause it's such a steep rise and then such a steep fall, you know, you go from Oakland to the white house and then from white house to like, you know, public enemy number one. And at no point do you really feel, um, understood. Um, in terms of what you're trying to do. When I was, in, when I was there and, and it, they had the wind at my back, people still didn't understand what I was trying to do. Like, I really believed all the stuff we were talking about in the Bay Area. You get to DC, when you fly from the Bay Area to DC, you're flying back in time. Like, they're not a part of this conversation about deep ecological solutions. I mean, they're still on some like, you know, don't litter and, and recycle type of conversation. And so you're like, there, there wasn't one ecological economist in the entire um, uh, Obama administration. So all the stuff that we just think is like normal, you know, kind of, you know, cost accounting for, nah. So it was all very traditional ec economists. I was just, you know, it, they never heard of bioneers, I'll tell you that, okay? And so, so that was tough. And then, you know, you leave under this cloud and that's tough and you think, you know, my, I'm never gonna be able to do anything again. I'm never going to be able to, to be successful. I'm never going to be able to, to, to shake this label of being some kind of a negative person. Um, and, and it doesn't go away in a week. You know, it, you know, it, takes, it takes years to just psychologically recover from that, find your way. Um, people, treat, people treat you very differently 
when they see you as a rising star versus a fallen star. And so you get a chance to see how, how people are. Um, you thought people liked you for you. Now they liked you because they thought you were going somewhere. Now it turns out you're not going that place, at least not right away. And then suddenly people who had a lot of respect for you allegedly like leave you out of stuff, talk over you. You know, your phone stops ringing. Your phone stops ringing when you lose a job that big. And so I had to go through all that. But I'm, now I can appreciate it uh, because you know, you look at uh, all the people who were in the administration, some, some stayed the whole time, some stayed less. Myself, I stayed, you know, very little time. Uh, but here we are 10 plus years later, you know, everybody's found a way uh, to be helpful. Uh, and I'm in that same bunch, you know, I get to work with Axelrod now on the other side, you know, and, um, and still get to listen to him and learn from him and stuff like that. And he doesn't hold it against me that I was, I mean, people don't even think about it. Um, but, you know, it's tough, man. Um, uh, and it's getting tougher. Uh, as long as you're the critic, you're safe. As long as you're just sitting back throwing punches and bombs and canceling people, you're safe. As long as you, oh, well, you know, you know uh, she said something and, and I think it's racist, let's everybody beat her up. Now you're safe. But if you raise your hand and you say, I have an idea. I wanna try something. Now you get a chance to see how tough it is because the people sitting up in the stands eating popcorn, who wearing loafers and pumps, who couldn't get out here in this field that they wanted to, will throw every brick and bat they can find at you your first mistake. Hmm. So, you know, uh, but I've been through it. I went through it, I went through it. And, and then the other thing about it is I, the one thing I decided I was not gonna become what I was fighting. I was not gonna return hate for hate. I was fighting just as hard for conservative red state, even racist Americans, is I was fighting for any other American. Because when you work in the White House, you are serving everybody. So, uh, you know, everybody. Mm -hmm. um, you cannot sit up in the White House, at least you're not supposed to, and pick and choose American. If you have a problem, if you're in Appalachia, you voted against our, our, our guy, you're a right winger, you're in the Ku Klux Klan, you're still an American. I still gotta make sure that you can see a doctor if you're sick. I still gotta make sure that your air and your water is clean. I still mm -hmm. got, it's a completely different uh, thing. When you, when, you, when you take that oath, that's a real oath. And you have, you have to live by that, by that. At least that's the way it was with the Obama administration. And so I said, look, as hard as I was fighting to get jobs and help for people in Appalachia and other part, and I'm from Tennessee, um, as hard as I was doing uh, working, you know, I'm not gonna let them turn me into something I'm not. And so I'm actually proud to say I'm actually friends now with Glenn Beck, uh, Glenn Beck who led the charge against me at, at Fox. I, I consider him a friend. Um, I've had a couple of meals with him. Uh, and, um, and I thought that was important. You know, uh, a lot of the people who are critical of me at Fox, I consider my friends now. We don't agree on things politically. But if, if, if I find out that, you know, one of them, their parents died or it's their birthday or they're sick or something like that, you know, I text them, I call them, you know, you can't become what you're fighting or why are you fighting? You know, we have to be better um, and not bitter about the things we've gone through. Um, you've, you've had the chance to live all of that now uh, as, as host of the CNN shows. Um, the Van Jones Show and and the Redemption Project, so much of which are about building those bridges and your guests on the Van Jones Show. I think I got this right. Tell me if I missed anyone or, or, or if anyone's incorrect, but you've had Steph Curry of the Warriors, Jay-Z, AOC, Oprah. Um, what what has this time been like working at one of the, the biggest, the biggest kind of media platforms in the country? What is that, what is that like now, especially in this political moment? Mm -hmm. Look, um, I, I, I can't tell you, you know, being able to work at CNN, you know, I would say working with Prince, because uh, when I left the Obama White House, he caught me, you know, and he took me in um, and he helped me get going. Uh, but so I'll put that at the top of my list of, of things. You know, most people would say the White House. Uh, but Prince always said, you went from working for a president to working for a prince. You got a promotion. <laughs> Love <laughs> so, it. 
Um, so poetic. Yeah, yeah. So I always put Prince at the top of the list. And, of course, the White House is always going to be on my, uh, you know, first in the obit. But, um, but working at CNN, I got a chance to meet people on both sides. You know, we're not Fox. We're not MSNBC. We're supposed to be in the middle. Trump makes that hard. Um, but we're supposed to be in the middle. And, um, um, and so, you know, I, I got to be friends with, with Newt Gingrich. I got to be friends with, you know, a lot of people on the right. Um, and I've learned from them. Uh, and I may, you know, I got a chance to, you know, when you have a TV show, everybody's nice to you, you know, because they think you're going to put them on and interview them and stuff like that. So I got a chance to meet, you know, all kinds of people. Um, but I try also used this show to go out into the country. I, I wasn't just interviewing celebrities. I was also going out into red parts of America and going into homes of Trump, Trump voters and doing stuff, pissing off liberals. But for me, I, I, I'm I'm still a 2008 hope hope and changer. I'm a 2008 Barack Obama hope and changer. I don't believe in red states and blue states. We got you know it's just the United States, and you got a bunch of assholes on all sides. I mean, you got horrible people um, in the Republican Party who are just awful, um, and frankly, now in the Democratic Party and the progressive movement, you got people getting awful on our side. Just terrible, mean, cancel culture. Ass I mean, just horrible. And if you're gonna sit here and say, well, I'm gonna make excuses for my horrible people and only focus on your horrible people, well, then how are you any better than the people you're fighting? What I've discovered, um, and, and if you don't do it, then you can't understand it. If you just sit there in your little blue bubble, in your little blue city, and you're looking at your little blue phone with all your little blue people you follow, then you know, you're going to have a blue view, and you won't actually have a, a true view. You know, A true view is, yeah, there are awful people on both sides. Uh, maybe more awful people in the Republican Party than the Democratic Party, but that's my bias. But there are awful people on both sides. Um, but that's the, that's the smallest problem we have in America. The biggest problem we have in America is that there are awesome people in both parties of all races, all classes, all faiths, all backgrounds, all ages, who just don't know what to do. We just don't know what to do. We don't know how to find each other. We don't know how to work together. We have an awesome people problem in the country that was much bigger than the awful people problem. The awful people are going to be awful. But the awesome people are not helping each other. And so I've committed, look, I am going to look for the awesome people. And wherever I find them, I'm going to bring them, you know, into my heart. And I, even with the awful people, if I can catch them doing something awesome, I'm going to brag on them and try to encourage the good. You know, geez, you know, how can you go and work in the Trump White I mean, work uh, on criminal justice in the Trump White House? How can you do this? How can you do that? I said, you know, the thing about it is I go into prisons multiple times a month. I did the Redemption Project, the first prime time show showing restorative justice inside the prison in the, in the history of American politics, the history of American television. I did that show, prime time restorative justice called Redemption Project. You can find it on the Dream Corps website, um, all eight episodes for free if you want to see what I believe in. And I'm talking to people who've killed people. I'm talking to people who have killed children horrible acts who want redemption, who want forgiveness, who want to atone, who want to apologize, who want to find some way to make up for it. Liberals love me. Progressives love me for that type of stuff. I'm going into prison houses. And then I go into the Trump White House to try to get people out of prison and people, and they, how can you go and deal with those terrible people? I said, hold on a second. Let me just, I mean, just to be clear, I, I don't agree with everything Jared Kushner does, but he hasn't, he's not a, He's not convicted of. So let me get this straight. You'd rather me, you, you, you can understand how I can give a second chance and see something good in a prison house, but you won't extend that same courtesy to somebody who's a Republican in the Trump White House. Well, I just don't agree with that. Uh, I, I, I just, you know, I'm old fashioned. I like to be consistent. Um, I am gonna fight with or against anybody in any party on behalf of the so-called least of these. In, in, our, in the Christian faith, as you mentioned, Jesus said, it's how you treat the least of these. That's how you're treating me. In other words, God is in everything, but most especially in the least of these. So the addicted, uh, the afflicted, the convicted, you know, people in jails, people who are on drugs, people who are poor, those are the people. And neither party does a damn thing for them most of the time. I've seen, I've been in, in West Virginia, and seeing people voting for Republicans 
three generations. They don't have a damn thing to show for it. And I've seen black and brown people in urban America been voting for Democrats for four or five generations and don't have much to show for it. So maybe neither of these parties care about the people at the bottom. So maybe we should put that to one side and come with real solutions for people at the bottom. And that's why I love your work. Listen, if we can start figuring out ways to scale up clean energy um, and shake up the power system, not just the, how you power the, the, the vehicles and buildings, um, but also how, you, how power works in a democracy. If you start bringing in different economic actors and players, giving different jobs and contracts to different people, that changes politics too. But I, I, I'm at peace with myself. I, I, man, I, sometimes I, 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 I hurt so bad I can't even cry uh, to, to, to be, again, so misunderstood. Um, uh, I'm, not, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm still on the left side of, of Pluto in terms of, you know, if you let me just design everything, you know, you know, you'd have a lot more money for people who don't have anything, a lot more opportunity for them. Um, and you have a lot less unaccountable power at the top. But I'm not going to hate anybody. Mm. And to see the progressive movement go from hope to hate in a 12-year period, the mm. way we talk is so hateful. The way that we are is so shitty and condescending. You know, we're being triggered. We're being traumatized. We're being re-traumatized. But then you can't act from there. You know, we're not having a worse experience than Nelson Mandela had. We're not having a worse experience than, uh, uh, than, than, than Gandhi and those guys had. We're not having a worse experience than Ella Jo Baker, Fannie Lou Hamer, Dr. King, or any of those people had. And they found a way to, to, to rise in dignity and grace and strength. But this crap we're doing on Twitter and to each other, this, 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 this not, it, it's, not, it's not who we are. And I'm not going to become what I'm fighting. I'm not going to feed what I'm fighting. Um, you know, uh, and, 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 um, and I'm getting to the point where, you know, the personal toll of, you know, getting called all these names and sell out and Uncle Tom and like black Twitter jumping me like that, that doesn't feel good. You know, it's not a good, it's, and, and uh, I, I don't, I don't want to be associated with a movement like that. I think we need a spiritual revolution inside this political revolution. Mm. I, think, I think we have to, um, you know, we have to find, when, we're not gonna out hate the haters. You're never gonna out divide the dividers. I mean, you're, 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 you're going to lose that fight. You mm. will, the, the people you, you are fixated on who are so hateful on the right, you'll never out hate them. All my liberal friends, you're not even good at hating people. I mean, it's just not even a skill. It's not even something you're good at doing. You know, you cry at every damn thing and like just like, soft. Like, what are you doing? <laughs> you're not even good at this. So, you know, let's 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 outwork them. Let's out love them. Let's out inspire them. Let's out innovate them. Let's out you know. Let's let's play to our strengths. Mm. Speaking of that need for that kind of revolutionary change, the killings of George Floyd and Breonna Taylor and Ahmaud Aubrey and so many others at the hands of police have galvanized this, this national conversation that's long overdue. And, and we're starting to see it percolate in clean energy and climate. What would you say to people listening who might regard systemic racism and the topic of clean energy as wholly separate issues? Well, you're, you're not as smart as you think you are. <laughs> Just dumb, because uh, first of all, the reason we haven't won is because of attitude. That's the attitude. So smart or stupid. Buddy, you're up against the biggest, most entrenched power base in human history, the dirty energy, fossil fuel people. These people, dig dead stuff out of the ground and burn it as like their way of, 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 of powering civilization. Like, like they literally run their civilization on death, <laughs> dead stuff. Okay. <laughs> like, you, I mean, get your head wrapped around that. They, they, you know, what coal has been dead for 600 years, something like I mean, 600 million years. I mean, they, these guys like look at this whole beautiful world with the sun shining and the wind and all sorts of stuff. Like, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to dig up dead shit. <laughs> That's gonna be my thing. So you're not dealing with normal kind of people. You're dealing with some very, very dark, sinister folk, folks who have a ton of money and have a trillion dollar a capital outlay globally just to pull all the dead stuff out of the ground and burn it. 
and you want to beat them with your little clever mind and your four white friends from college, you're not that bright. You're just not as bright as you think you are. You have to build a big green growth alliance around. You got to have a lot of people bought into you that are willing to resist a lot of brutality from, you know, some of these petro dictators willing to, you know, and, and, and bribes and stuff. You, what are you talking about? What are you talking about? And that's why, I mean, look, the whole green thing, I walked away from it and started focusing on other stuff because I got tired of telling white people the same thing over and over again. And it's so condescending. Oh, Van Jones, you're so inspiring. Come give us a speech. You haven't seen me go to a green conference in almost 10 years because I became a minstrel, you know, like just to, you know, basically uh, trading in, in tissues and goosebumps for white people, mm -hmm. but no jobs for my people. Mm -hmm. And then when they started getting their butts kicked politically, then now, oh, well, you know, why, why aren't we getting the support? Because you haven't given any support. You know, what would you say to, to, to those leaders that, that are literally controlling power and, and controlling so much capital who, who do actually, at least they think they want to address systemic racism? What mm -hmm. do you want them to know? Well, listen, um, there's a tremendous opportunity for authentic partnership. Okay. I'm not on, the, I'm not, I don't want pity. Uh, I want partnership. Uh, I bring a lot to the table. You know, my community brings a lot to the table. Because we don't have a lot of resources, we're very resourceful, mm. uh, very creative, um, hustle, grind. So we have a lot of soul. Um, we, you know, our, sh our stuff is dope. I mean, people, <laughs> you know, you say Beyonce, uh, you know, the, the penguins want to hear what she's doing. I mean, it's like we just, <laughs> you know, we bring, you know, we bring a lot to the table. Um, but it has to be fair and equitable exchange. You know, if we're gonna, you know, we can bring a lot of cultural capital and political capital, like let's, you know, the Congressional Black Caucus, you can't pass a bill without us. Simple as that. You can't pass a bill without us. You know, I mean, you know, I can talk warm and, warm and fuzzy or I can talk the other way. Um, yeah. So, you know, you can't pass a bill without us. Um, you can't sell a product without us um, because it's corny without us. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, we, we can make it politically viable, we can make it culturally relevant. Um, so we bring that capital to the table. You might bring financial capital to the table. Well, it needs to be a fair and equitable exchange. If mm -hmm. I'm going to lend my cultural cool to you and my political stuff, then you need to make sure there's some capital on this side of the table when we're done. Mm -hmm. Quit pimping people and, and using people. So the first thing is understand that there's value here. It's not a pity party that you're, you're, you're leaving allies and, and advantage on the table by just sticking with your own little, little buddies. Mm. Speaking of capital, um, what advice would you give to entrepreneurs who are listening, who, who do want to make a difference in their communities, companies, industries, in the clean energy and mobility space? And especially what would you say to those underrepresented founders, Black, Latino women founders who are, are just not seen as frequently as they should be in this industry? Um, well, first of all, I would say hang in there. You know, uh, who, who knew? that suddenly we have this big you know, racial awakening, this great awakening. I mean, who knows what other awakenings are gonna come? Um, and so, uh, you know, resilience and perseverance and those kind of things, those qualities, um, you know, I, be I believe they will be more and more rewarded because in the same way that the, the plague and uh, the ecological crisis and stuff has kind of torn the floor out from under us, it's also torn the ceiling out from over us. Hmm. So we can fly or fall based on, on our own efforts. It, it, it's a funny feeling, it's called freedom, but that's kind of what's happening. Um, you know, and I see you know, one, of, one of my friends here says that I'm not being, to, to be fair, I don't think dig up dead stuff reflects the openness I was describing earlier. It doesn't capture the motivation to deliver energy and power to people that need it, especially before there were renewables. I think that's a fair criticism of my point. Um, but, but what I will also say is that, um, I have a lot of friends in the, in the fossil fuel industry. And I, I say friends, I mean it. Um, there is a way that there's a spiritual dimension to, what, to, to your work. And I don't think I'm being mean or unfair to point out the people I meet who want to repower, um, change the way we power our bodies with organic agriculture, permaculture. They have a different vibration than the people who I know who want to keep doing it the more poison-based agricultural way. I love those people, but they have a different vibration to them. And the people I know who want to repower how we power our machines and our buildings, 
they have a different vibration to them. But the pro what, what I, what I want to point out is that that vibration then seems to only extend so far. Okay. Mm. You know, listen, I'm very close to, to the people who I mean, people get mad at me, but I work on criminal justice with the folks from Coke industries, Coke industries. They are bad. I mean, when it comes to, I mean, you know, they're not joking around their vision of kind of continuing on the path we're on in terms of dirty energy. They're committed to that. Their view of democracy to me feels like more $1, one vote than one person, one vote all too often. So I fight them on a bunch of stuff. I work with them on criminal justice reform because as libertarians, they don't want to have big uh, government bureaucracies gobbling up liberties and money. So we have a, we, an interesting, uh, you know, kind of alliance for, and sometimes fight. Um, the, that vibration that comes from defending the status quo on energy is a real thing. And I don't find that vibration when I'm dealing with people who are in the solar space and other spaces, but it doesn't extend far enough. It needs to extend deeply into communities that have been left out. Um, we should not be building a, an environmental movement uh, that Dr. King would be ashamed of, that Ella Jo Baker and Fannie Lou Hamer would be ashamed of, that Bayard Rustin and John Lewis would be ashamed of in terms of how racially segregated it is. And so um, I'm tough on my friends from the pollution-based fossil fuel industry. Um, I appreciate you sticking up for them a little bit. That makes me very happy. I'm happy to clarify my point. Um, but I'm also tough on my friends in the green in, uh, industry because their limitations become the limitations for the whole planet. We're going to close in the last five minutes with our high voltage round. These are quick questions, quick answers, quick, like a couple of words. First question. And I cannot wait to hear this because I do not know the answer. If you were going to be an animal, what animal would you be and why? I would be a ferret. <laughs> why? I don't know because they're fast. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I'd be a mongoose. I'd be a mongoose because they, they're fast and they kill snakes. <laughs> Um, if you had to start a new career tomorrow, what would it be? I would make comic books. Hmm. I do remember that about you. <laughs> Other than yourself, to whom do you attribute your success? My parents. When have you failed? Uh, today. <laughs> 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 I mean, look, all the time. I mean, it's just a, a rambling trail of disasters and we just kind of pick out the good stuff to put in the resume. Uh, but 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 <laughs> Wikipedia's got plenty of them. Trust me, <laughs> the failures. Uh, what's the best investment you've ever made? Uh, just in my own spiritual development, um, mm. therapy, um, learning about uh, Buddhism, Hinduism, uh, chanting, praying, uh, meditation. Um, you never regret. I've never been anybody. You know, I wasted all that time doing yoga and meditation. What was I thinking? Never heard that. <laughs> never heard. That. Uh, what is something that you thought was true that you no longer believe? Mm, something I thought was true. Well, you know, I was, you know, I was very anti-capitalist, you know, hardcore um, anti-capitalist. Um, and I thought that basically enterprise innovation was just sort of um, code words for exploitation and cover story for oppression. Um, and I don't think that anyway. It can be. It can be. But I find myself more, I want to fight against the worst in business, but for the best in business. I want to fight against the worst in government, but for the best. I want to fight against the worst in myself and for the best. And so it means you have to think a little bit harder. Um, but uh, you know, I, used to, I used to think that all, all capitalism was bad, and um, I don't think I anymore. When are you your best self? Um, probably with my sons. Um, when I put the phone down and I'm not distracted with <laughs> my social media addiction. What is your worst trait? Uh, I'm incredibly poorly organized. So it takes a lot of staff to get anything to actually happen. Uh, I think about a lot of things. I propose a lot of things. Um, but I, basically, I communicate, convene, and catalyze very well. Hmm. So I can communicate well. I can get people to pay attention, come. I can get things started. But the next you know, steps of implementation, I always need a lot of help with. But luckily mm -hmm. now we have a team around me that, that helps with that. So it's less of, a, less, of a down, uh, mm -hmm. less of a detriment. If you could change one thing about the world, what would it be? Uh, empathy. Empathy. Yeah. If, if there was, 
sorry, go ahead. Yeah. No, it's, it's, it's a, uh, it's, it's the mindset that makes everything else possible. Like the 20th century mindset of competition, domination, achievement is important. Actually, you don't want to lose all of that because it is a competitive world, but you need that 21st century mindset of empathy. You know, you're going to deal with a billion Indians, a billion, uh, Chinese people, a billion Africans. Um, and that's just, you know, right off the bat, um, you got to be able to empathize and understand where people are coming from. And you also have to have the, the, the not just the mindset of empathy, but the skill set of listening. We don't listen well. So, uh, and then honestly, if you had that, everything else takes care of itself because then you, you can partner authentically across difference with anybody because you can kind of understand where they're coming from and they can understand where you're coming from. And then you unlock the genius of the whole human family. And then these problems get very small. Um, mm -hmm. The reason problems are so big is because you know, it's just going to be me and my, you know, how ridiculous would you, would I look to you, Emily, if I said me and my fellow straight black guys are going to fix everything. You say, that's just stupid. There's not enough of you. <laughs> um, right. But then you see with the, mm. you know, some of our environmental friends, like basically they function as if me and my white guy friends are going to mm. fix everything. Mm. It's like, there's not enough of you guys. Honestly, it may seem that way, but there's really like, you're like a very small <laughs> number of people. Like there's, a, mm -hmm. And so, so, but to be able to really, you want cultural humility when you're in the majority, especially, but not humiliation, right? Mm -hmm. Just, just, mm -hmm. just that little cultural humility so you can kind of partner well, listen to other people, but not, we, this cancel culture now is looking for humiliation. Mm -hmm. You know, they want people to just feel bad about themselves for being white or bad about themselves for being whatever they are. We don't want that because then that turns, that curdles and turns into resentment and then a backlash. We just want a little bit of humility so we could all listen, listen to each other and then play well together and then win, 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 win and have all kind of fun and joy. You know, that's what we're aiming for. If there was just one or two people who are gonna hear this podcast, who would you want them to be? Whoever you think. I mean, you're, 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 the, you're <laughs> the, the, the leadership now. I'm the, I'm the old guy. <laughs> you, you know, wherever, you, wherever you send it. You know, I, 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 I'm up in my fifties now. So, you know, whoever, whoever you would tell me to send it to is where I send it to. That sounds good. Um, uh, finish these sentences for me. Companies or organizations fail because. Companies fail because they, because they don't tap the true genius of everybody who's involved. You got some people who are sitting there in the boardroom and they got to, they, they don't feel welcome. They don't feel understood. They don't feel that they can really contribute. So they either raise their hand and say what they really think and get blown out because they're, you know, difficult. I think, I think really your intern knows a lot more than you think about you <laughs> um, and about your company. Um, you know, that woman of color who's been the receptionist knows a lot more than you think, you know, there's a lot of there's a lot of wasted genius in these organizations because of all these hierarchies and biases that um, you know I think we need to to take more seriously. If you really knew me, you would know uh, that I'm still a big nerd. <laughs> <laughs> um, success is peace within yourself, knowing that you're worthy and that you're enough. If I could have done one thing differently, I would have. Probably just spent more time with the boys, you know, on the road a bunch. If the world knew me for one thing, it would be. Uh, you know, I got a lot of brand confusion, so I don't know. <laughs> no idea. No idea. <laughs> uh, last two questions. I'm most proud of. My boys. And lastly, to build a successful movement, what it takes is? Solidarity. Mm. Um, solidarity. And solidarity is a two-way street. And I say solidarity, not charity. Um, the great um, revolutionary from Mozambique, Samora Michelle, said, we seek solidarity, not charity. Solidarity is an act of mutual aid between two forces pursuing the same objective. Solidarity is an act of mutual aid. You're not helping me. I'm not helping you. We're helping each other because we're trying to pursue the same objective, a human civilization at peace with itself and the earth where everybody gets to shine, where the, our technology actually is pro-life, 
in the real sense of the word, pro-life for the next seven, eight, nine generations. Um, and, uh, and that's a worthy goal. And that's a, that's a goal worthy of your life and giving it all. But you and your crew and me and my crew by ourselves, we can't get there. We can only get there together. And the way we, that empathy is the mindset, listening is a skill set, and solidarity is a strategy. Dan, this means the world to me, you joining. I wouldn't be who I am. I wouldn't mm. be what I'm doing. Powerhouse wouldn't exist if it wasn't for you. So it just, it mm. means so much to me that you were willing to do this and share so much wisdom with people who, you know, may be hearing some of these concepts for the first time, but absolutely need to hear them and, and will benefit from them. So yeah. thank you. Um, and to everyone who participated, thank you for, for your questions, for your engagement. Um, really happy that we're all in this together. Um, thank